Network. Your source for everything paranormal. Parasex. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We aren't the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen, and we're brought to you every Sunday night on the Parrax Radio Network. Tonight is going to be a wonderful show. I'm very excited about it. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I will be doing the channeling. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I will be asking the questions of our spirit guests this evening. Last week, we channeled the spirit of Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, for over 30 years. If you missed it, the channeling is available on our YouTube channel. Tonight, we will be speaking with, the two, spirit, with two spirit guests, General George Custer and the famous Sioux War Chief, Crazy Horse. We will be discussing in detail the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, where the 7th Cavalry was defeated and Custer was killed. If you like American history, this is going to be a great show. Okay, we never know in advance what our guests are going to say, so it's always prudent to do our usual disclaimer. The opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits, do not necessarily reflect our opinions or those of the Para X Network or our sponsors. And I would like to thank all of you that take the time to listen to our show and especially to join us in the chat room. Your questions are always appreciated. Please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our audience and the education we're putting out there. Okay, before we channel, as you know, we always say a prayer of protection. The prayer was given to us by the guides. And when we first began to communicate uh, with the spirit. So Connie's going to say the prayer and we will begin this channel with our two guests tonight. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the Battle of Little Bighorn, so I'm going to give a brief, brief history of the events that took place. On June 26th and 27th of 1876, the most epic battle of the Sioux Indian Wars took place on Little Bighorn River in southern Montana. A fighting force of over 2,000 Lakota Sioux and northern Cheyenne engaged the U.S. 7th Cavalry with a total force of 700 men under the command of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Five of the 7th Cavalry's 12 companies were annihilated, and Custer was killed. The casualty count included 268 dead, 55 severely wounded, of which six later died of their wounds. At the time, the 7th Cavalry was considered the finest fighting force in the U.S. Army. Sitting Bull, Chief Gull, and Crazy Horse were the leaders of the Native Americans. Now, days before the battle, Native American scouts working for Custer had reported that the encampment along the Little Bighorn was one of the largest camps they've ever observed. Desiring to quickly engage, Colonel Custer gave the orders to split the 7th into three battle groups. West Point graduate Major Marcus Reno was given three companies in order to attack the Indian village from the south. Reno opened the battle, formed a skirmish line, and absorbed a full brunt of the Indian defense of the, of the village. His line broke. Reno led a hasty retreat across the river and up a steep bluff. By the time that he managed to find the high ground, he had lost 40 of his 140 soldiers and had left many behind in the, in the woods to fend for themselves. A second group of three companies under the command of Captain Frederick Benteen 
met Major Reno on the bluff and they set up a defensive perimeter. They'd be involved in deadly combat with the Sioux and Cheyenne for the next two days. Both officers would claim they did not realize Custer was being annihilated approximately four miles from their position. Colonel Custer, with five companies, determined that he'd attack the main village. The colonel believed the military reports that there were no more than 800 hostiles in the area, but there were over 2,000 warriors in the village under the command of Crazy Horse City Bull and, and Chief Gull. The attack on the village failed, and all the soldiers under Custer's command were killed. Neither Reno nor Benteen came to reinforce Custer. Now, we're going to begin by channeling the spirit of Lieutenant Colonel Custer, and then we will speak with Crazy Horse. So, Tommy, if you'd like to begin to the questions, I think this is going to be a good one. First, I would like to thank you, Colonel Custer, for coming and speaking with us this evening. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I would. I would like to thank Barry and Connie for allowing me to come through again. I've been with them in the past, and I know that Barry wrote a chapter about the battle in his conspiracy book. He treated me with respect. He treated the Native Americans with respect in the book, and we appreciate that. I was a very aggressive person. I had fought in the cavalry for the North in the Civil War. I had attained the rank of general. But after the war, there was, weren't, they reduced the size drastically of the army, so I became a lieutenant colonel, but chose to continue to work with the army in the West and try to protect the settlers. I know that there were mistakes made during the battle. You're going to hear about some of them, and I'm going to be quite truthful. I want people to remember the bravery on both sides. This was a very difficult time in American history. And I sincerely hope that people don't forget us. So, Connie, I know that you have questions, so let's begin. Thank you. In 1874, you led a major expedition into the Black Hills of South Dakota, one to lands that had been promised as sacred lands of the Sioux through a treaty with, by the U.S. government. What were the results of this expedition, and how did the Sioux Nation react? Well, the results of the Sioux, of, of the expedition into the Black Hills was that we discovered gold. Once news of that got out, prospectors flooded the area. The Black Hills had been the traditional sacred lands of the Sioux Nation. Earlier, we had negotiated treaties with the Sioux and promised that their land would not be taken. I wish that things had been different. I wish that I had, had not taken place, had not been in charge of this expedition, because it was this action that essentially triggered the Great Sioux Indian Wars. Once the prospectors started flooding into the Black Hills, there was no end to it. And the Sioux realized that they would be losing the lands where their ancestors had been buried. The Black Hills expedition had, had a very negative effect on the Native Americans, both the Cheyenne and the Sioux. Gold triggered the greed, and the greed triggered the brutality towards the Native Americans. I truly wish it could have been different. Did you have a role in the treaty that was broken by the expedition? I had met with the Cheyenne and I had smoked the peace pipe with them and promised that we would not that I would not participate in another attack against them. Keep in mind that I had been involved in several other actions. And and I indeed did break that promise. 
When you were told of the size of the village on the Little Bighorn, why did you not believe your Indian scouts? The 7th was part of a three-pronged attack. The previous guides or the previous Native American scouts had reported that there would not be as many warriors as we as we found. They told us that there would be possibly 800, 900. We had a great fighting force. I believed the military information that we had been given. I did not realize that there had been other actions that had delayed our three-pronged force that we thought would come against the the villages that the Sioux and Cheyenne were forming. My Indian scouts were very explicit. They told me they had never seen as many teepees in one area. I was not able to view. I know we were standing on a high hill and my scouts were saying, there they are, you got you must see this, but I truly never understood the true scope of what we were going up against. Why did you feel it was so important to rush the, to the attack on the village? I felt that Indian scouts would inform the warriors in the village of our presence. I felt that once they did that, they would break camp and scatter, and we would have to chase that, them down in small groups. I felt that if we rushed as rapidly as possible to attack the village, that we could capture the women and children, negotiate with the warriors, and perhaps get them to go back on the reservations. My scouts also told me that a group of Indians had crossed our tracks, and I felt very strongly that the village had been warned, but in fact they had not. You were offered additional cavalry and Gatling guns for your expedition. Why did you turn them down? I wanted I wanted to be able to move as rapidly as possible. I knew that the that the Native Americans would be moving rapidly. I stripped down the equipment that the men were carrying. I wanted to be able to travel as many miles in a day as possible. The Gatling gun was not a proven weapon at that time. It was heavy. It would have slowed us down. It had problems jamming from the black powder. I also ordered my soldiers not to carry the sabers with them. I felt that the rattling of sabers could give away our location during certain situations. I wanted to move as rapidly as the Indians could move, and that was the bottom line. Your men were armed with single-shot rifles and handguns, while many of the Indians had repeaters. Did you approve of the way the 7th was armed? I felt that the heavier weapons of the breech loaders that we had gave us a distance advantage. The men could still fire the weapon fairly fast. I know that during the Civil War, many of our cavalry troops had used repeaters to great success. The Army, after the war, was trying to utilize the equipment that they had they were trying to utilize the equipment to make the guns. I wish that some of my guys would have had repeaters. It would have definitely helped. But at the time, I felt that we were satisfactorily armed. What I didn't realize was how many of the Indians had such modern weaponry. The morning of the battle, many of your scouts reverted to their native dress. Why did you dismiss them? I felt that they needed to wear the uniform of the Army. I did not feel that when they reverted to their Indian dress, 
that they were showing the confidence. I know many of the scouts felt that they would they would die on that day. Many of them wanted to simply be wearing their native dress so that they would pass if if they were killed. They would go they would go to their as we referred to it sometimes the happy hunting ground. I felt that they were making a mistake. I did not want our soldiers to mistake the scouts for the enemy. Would it have been more effective if you had not divided your troops and used all 12 companies in a single attack? In in hindsight, probably. I think we could have carried our charge into the village. I know that they were not expecting us. I thought that we had lost the advantage of surprise. I wanted I wanted Reno to be able to cut off retreat routes. I wanted Benteen to be able to do the same. I honestly thought that when we engaged that they would they would split and run. That obviously did not happen. At what point did you actually understand the size of the opposing Native American force? We could hear that Reno had engaged. Like we could hear his gunfire, and we heard a lot of answering fire of calibers that were not of his weaponry. I had my, my men with me. There was a high hill overlooking the Little Bighorn River and overlooking the village of the Indians. I never really had a full view until we crossed at the head of that coulee. When I saw when I saw the size, I was taken back. I was hoping that there would not be a high warrior to civilian ratio. With Reno engaged, I knew that we had no no choice but to attack. I put my men in in a line of battle and we came down the edge of the coulee. But I must say that when I did finally see the village it was a shock. Were you and your men planning to kill women and children? We did not give orders as such. But we knew that in the past, our battles, that we had taken many civilian lives. When Reno attacked, and I didn't know it at the time until I got back over, but his first volley had killed Chief Gull's two wives and children. It was, it was a sad reality, but, but we knew that there would be women and children killed. Why did your attack on the village fail? Reno was absorbing most of the, of the warriors at the time we started our charge. As I came to the river, there were a few warriors they were trying to defend the village. One of them fired, and I was hit in the abdomen with a bullet. It knocked me from my horse, and when the men saw that I had been hit, the attack stopped. They took time to try to help me back up on my horse. I was was hit very bad. I was hit in the lower abdomen. By the time that I got back onto the horse, the men were disorganized. The warriors had heard the gunfire and had rushed from Reno and were coming. By the time that we had reorganized, we were meeting very, very stiff resistance from the warriors. They were protecting their families. They were protecting their children. They were firing at us. They were using their bows, their arrows. 
we, at that point, began to retreat. I think that had I not been hit initially, that we would have had much more success. Was there any way other than your injury where your attack could have been more successful? I think if I had maintained all 12 divisions and had been able to carry out a successful surprise attack on the village, we could have had a chance. But the odds were so overwhelming. The reality is there's, there's no way, I think, that we could have been successful against over 2,000 of some of the best Native American fighters that ever existed. Were the Indians armed with anything other than bows and arrows? Absolutely. We were facing repeater fire. Some of the Indians had modern weapons. In those days, that there was a black market for guns just the same as there is now, and we did not realize just how, how well the majority of the warriors in the village were armed. They, had, they were bringing intense fire upon us, and I honestly believe that they were better armed than we were. Did Reno surprise the warriors in the village? Yes, they were. They were not. A, a, they were not a, waiting for him. They responded once he set his skirmish line and fired that first volley, killing women and children. The warriors rushed to attack him. Do you blame Reno for your defeat? No, I really don't. There were things. There were mistakes that he made. But he was he was going to be overwhelmed. Keep in mind that he only had three divisions with him, and he had, he had no artillery. And he was taking the brunt of the first defensive movements of of the warriors. He had literally no choice but to retreat, and I think that he was lucky he was not totally destroyed as well. In your opinion, did Reno and Benteen act properly? Yes. I had hoped that Benteen would would have come to reinforce our actions. But once he saw that Reno had taken so many losses, and he realized that the warriors were clo- were going to continue their attack upon him, he took, basically took charge and set up a defensive perimeter. And it was only that defensive perimeter that allowed any of his men to escape. In your opinion, uh, in in retrospect, is there any tactic that could have led to success in the Little Bighorn battle? I think the only way that we could have been successful is to have had a much larger manpower pool. If we had had infantry, if we had had more cavalry, and I'm not talking about just a few divisions. We never expected to be facing over 2,000 warriors. All of our planning was based on the fact that the chiefs could bring together maybe eight, 900 to fight against us. How were you killed and who killed you? As I stated earlier, I was first hit in the abdomen as I was trying to lead the charge across the Little Bighorn. Once that happened, we retreated up to last, what you now refer to as Last Stand Hill. I was very weak up there. The men around me were fighting as bravely as they could. Many of them saved their last bullet for themselves. None of them wanted to be captured because they realized what would happen. I was very weak by the time that the fighting started to subside and the Indians were upon us. I was never really confident or totally sure of who fired the critical round to my temple. 
I always suspected it may have been Crazy Horse because he was, he would seem to be everywhere in the battlefield. He was an incredible fighter, and I know you're going to be speaking with him, and I just want you to know that he and I are now friends on the other side. I have the greatest respect for him. He was a great warrior, and he respects me as well. Did you father a child named Yellow Swallow with a Cheyenne mistress named Miyatsi? Yes. I am, I'm, I am sorry to say that I did. Miyatsi was a wonderful woman. She was beautiful. We had taken her prisoner in one of the in one of the actions. I had actually tried to hire her as a as an interpreter, even though she could not speak English. We did have an affair. I told her that I would return to her, which I knew was not going to be true at the time. It is one of the things that I was judged harshly for. But yes, I did father. I did father a son. Why did the Indians mutilate the bodies of their enemies? The Indian, enemy, the Indians felt that they would have to fate, face their enemies in the afterlife. They felt that if they mutilated the bodies, that those bodies would be at a severe disadvantage when they had to face them once more. It was. It was something that they did for their protection in the afterlife. Why wasn't your body mutilated like the bodies of the other soldiers? The Indians realized that I had a son and that I had had a relationship with with the Cheyenne woman. She f- considered us married. The Indians also understood this, and for that reason, they respected my body while all the others were mutilated. Now that you're on the other side, do you see any of the Indians that participated in your death? Yes, I see many of them, actually. I see Sitting Bull, I see Gull, I see I see Crazy Horse, who's with you tonight. I see many. I also see many of the individuals that I fought with in the Civil War. It's very different over here. There, There is no hatred. Souls get along, even those that fought each other and maybe even killed each other. Okay, I have a question from our chat room. How were you judged when you returned to the other side? I had done some things that were wrong, but I I had done many things that were right. I had been a good military leader. I had saved the lives of many of my men. During the Civil War, I had served the country. I had defended the people. I did all that was asked of me. I was was not judged very harshly. I was told about the things that I did wrong, but that is the way of things. If you had it to do over, what changes would you make in your battle plans? I would have brought many more troops. Okay. After your defeat at the Battle of Little Bighorn, many Indians were massacred by the U.S. Army in different events. As you watched from the other side, how did that affect you? I was greatly saddened. Once I knew that, it, once I looked at things from the other side, I realized that there would be great revenge by the Army for what had happened to us. My own decisions led to a lot of the cruelty that was to follow. I was very, very sad to see it. Okay, and as you watch from the other side, what do you think of the way the government has treated the Native Americans? I think that it has been terrible. When you were living during those days, you saw the Indians different. Manifest Destiny said that the settlers should move west. The Indians knew that they were losing their land. We were killing the buffalo. We were starving them. We were forcing them onto reservations. We didn't feed them in the reservations. As I watched, it saddened me greatly because I did have great respect for the Native Americans. 
Colonel, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. I would hope that the current residents of the United States take a look at how the Native Americans are continuing to be treated. Their reservations are are terrible. They live in poor conditions. They aren't educated. I would hope that they would look at them and that they would bring help to them. They would educate them. All you have to do is educate the Native Americans. They are wonderful people. They were here before us. We took their lands. There are many things that we did for which we should be ashamed. Thank you for allowing me to come through. I know the crazy horse is here, and he would like to speak. Thank you again, Colonel. And I totally agree with your opinion on the Native Americans. I've met some, and they're wonderful, gracious people. A crazy horse, welcome. Thank you, Connie. Appreciate your coming. Would you like to begin with the message? Yes, I would. I am obviously speaking from the other side of the of the battle of the Little Bighorn. I watched the white man come into the West. We had no concept of land ownership. We felt it was all ours. That was the way it had always been. We had fought with other Indian nations, the Crows, the Arikia. The, there were many that we fought with. We did not live peaceful lives. We felt that where our ancestors were buried, that that was our land forever. The government would come in and they would offer us treaties. They would make promises to us. But they would always break their promises. I realized that the only way that we had a chance to protect our lands were, were to fight for them. I became a warrior chief. I did all that I could to assure that my people could maintain their lands, that they could live where their ancestors had roamed, that they could eat on the buffalo, that they could, that they could prosper. It was impossible. There were so many of the white men that was coming to, that wanted to come west, When gold was discovered in the Black Hills, it was truly the end of our heritage. We had been told that man would, would not be allowed to come into the Black Hills. That was our promised land, our holy land. Once gold was discovered, all bets were off. We did the best we could with what we had. Every time we would try to make a treaty with the white man, it would be broken. I reached the point that I said, why would we even try? We just need to do our best to protect our people and try to preserve our ways of life. I know that the white man wanted to settle the West. They felt that they could just take what they wanted. They wanted the gold. They agreed. We simply wanted to pursue our way of life. I guess it was just that simple. Sounds reasonable. Why were you given the name Crazy Horse? Actually, that was the name of some of my, the members of my family. As I became a warrior chief, I assumed the name of my father. And even though, as you look at it today, you might think, focus simply on the word crazy. When in battle, people called me crazy. I had had visions that I would be protected in battle, and as long as I followed the rules of those visions, I could fight as I wished. When in battle, I had no concern for my personal safety. I had no fear of death. I knew that we would be going to a place that would be fine. Native Americans were very spiritual. We did, not, we did not fear death. We feared not being brave in battle. Death 
we knew would come. It was inevitable. Why fear it? Why were there never any pictures taken of you? I felt that if a picture was taken, it would weaken my soul. I never wanted to be photographed as the other Native Americans were. I just wanted to try to protect my people and my and, and our traditions. I felt that photographs would weaken your soul. What was your opinion of Custer's expedition into the Black Hills? I was very upset by it because, I, as I stated earlier, I knew that would be the beginning of the end. When he announced that there was gold in the Black Hills, our way of life had essentially ended. I knew that he had spoken of peace with the Cheyenne, and I knew that he had broken his promise of peace. I knew that he was a, a great soldier. I knew that he was very brave, and I knew he was a person to be feared. On the day of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, did you have any knowledge that customers the seven, in the 7th Cavalry were going to attack the village? No. We had been involved with the battle in approximately a week of your time earlier. We had defeated the U.S. Army, the infantry at that point. We were still celebrating that victory. Our scouts had not brought back any word that the cavalry was close to attacking our village. We had put together a huge amount of warriors, of families, we were going to protect our way of life at all risk. Many of us had left the, the reservations. It was a terrible way of life, and we were just trying to get back all that we loved and our way of life. Will you tell us about your involvement in the battle? When the battle started, we heard the gunfire. I knew that Chief Gall had his people on the side of the village that was being attacked. I knew that his warriors had rallied. They came to me and they said we were being attacked. I always had a small ritual that I did. I I wanted to I wanted to protect my horse. I wanted to protect myself. I put I used paint to put a lightning bolt on my cheek. That was what I had seen when I was having my visions. It took me a bit of time, but as soon as I was ready and I was prepared that I knew I knew that I would be protected, I joined the battle. I started to move towards where Reno was fighting. When I heard the gunfire on the other side of the Little Bighorn River, I turned and I led my warriors to where the general was leading a charge. When I got there, the blue coats were in disarray. We immediately attacked them to protect the village. We drove them up the hill. We scattered them. And yes, we killed all of them. Were you aware when you started that you were fighting Custer? No. We had heard rumors that he was in the field, but it was not until we engaged in the battle that we realized that it was the 7th Cavalry. I guess it was probably within the first half hour of your time that I realized that we were indeed engaged with Custer's men. What was your opinion of General Custer? I knew that he was a strong fighter. I knew that he was to be feared and I knew I knew that he would do whatever he needed to do to win the battle. Okay. Why did Custer stop his attack on the village at the Little Bighorn River? As I found, as I realized later, that he had been wounded. 
when one of our braves fired and hit him, he knocked him into the river, and it basically ended the charge. It was, I guess, a stroke of luck, or it was the, it was the will of the great spirit at the time. But once Custer was wounded, leadership was not there to provide the, the guidance that was required. And it really became a fairly simple battle for us after that time. Yeah, how long did the battle last on Custer Hill? I don't think it lasted for an hour of your time. We had many warriors that were rallying. They did. We had many warriors that were rallying to protect their families. And it was a very short battle. Okay. What was the reason that your people mutilated the bodies of soldiers? As the general said, it was done so when we had to face them again in the afterlife, mm-hmm. that they would be, that they would would not have their full facilities. Okay, I want to take a break here and ask a few questions from our listeners. One is, one of our listeners is a Lakota, and she she wants to know if you hear their voices when they speak to you today. We do hear some of the voices. Yes. We try to give guidance. We try to give guidance and help. But when when you pray to us by name, I do generally hear the voices. Okay, and another question is, how can we restore the great buffalo herds? Is it even possible? It's impossible. Development has has expanded to such a point that there simply are not lands available for the great herds that used to 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 roam the plains and upon which we de- <laughs> upon which we depended for food. Okay. When your people were mutilating the bodies of the soldiers, why didn't they mutilate Custer's body? As George said, they realized that he had been married to a Cheyenne woman when an individual has been married to a Native American. They do respect their bodies, even though they they did they, he he did break his promises and tried to bring violence to the people that he promised to live in peace with. Why did you not wipe out Reno and Benteen's men? Sitting Bull was a great leader great political leader. He was not so much of a of a warrior chief, but he was very aware of the politics and what would take place. He warned us that if we wiped out all of the men, that revenge of the army would simply wipe out all of us as well. While we did continue to fight with him, there were there were many that listened to Sitting Bull and did not participate. Had we attacked Reno and Benteen in strength, we could have wiped them out. Yeah. What is your opinion of Sitting Bull? Sitting Bull is very, very wise. He was a great leader. We see him over here. We spend time with him. He is. He had good advice. I think that he sadly understood the inevitability of trying to preserve our ways of life. Do you associate with any of the soldiers that fought at Little Bighorn? Yes. Once we're over here, as George said, there is no, there's no hatreds. I mean, there are people that dislike each other and they just simply avoid. The souls don't have forms. They don't have guns to kill or knives to scalp with. We associate with the soldiers. Their, their souls are no different than ours. Why did you surrender yourself and your people to the army at Fort Robinson in Nebraska? The army was in close pursuit of us. We had no food. They had killed our buffalo. My people were starving. I felt that we had reached a point 
where the only way I could preserve the lives of my people was to surrender. And I did so with dignity. I knew that we would be delegated to reservations, but I felt that that was the only way they could live. You were mortally wounded by a bayonet stab in the back. Was your death a murder? I think it was well planned. I was I was very upset by what was taking place. I was being accused of saying things that I never said. The Indian police that were watching over me, many of them were crows and hated me. Many of the trans the translator even lied about the things that I said. They said that I was going to kill the commander, that I was going that I was going to leave the resurrection. I had pledged that I would live in peace. I was going to live up to that. I think they felt that as long as I was alive, that there was a great risk that I would once again lead my warriors off the reservation. But I guess I was foolish to believe that the soldiers were speaking truths after all the lies that I'd been told through the years. Were you resisting arrest at all? I had told them to take their hands off of me. I had tried to have them move their, to remove their hands. They were pushing and shoving me. They were not treating me with any respect. I did not I was not truly resisting. I think that the soldier with the bayonet was told to kill me if I, if I had the opportunity. Did you have any weapons when you were stabbed in the back? No. They made up a story that I had knives that I pulled out from under my blanket, but that was not true. That was just another lie that they said. Yeah. We've got a few more questions out of our chat room. Have you returned to Earth since you were crazy horse? No, I have not. I have tried to influence those that were controlling power over my people. I have tried to give leadership and guidance from this side when it was asked of me, but I have not chosen to reincarnate. And at the present time, I am probably not going to do it. Is the other side what you expected? No, it's far different. How is it different? I never expected what I was to see on my passing. I always thought that the other side, the afterlife, would be but an extension of our way of life. When I came over, it was all soul energies. They were in forms. My, my family was there that had been, been killed. It was a very, very strange experience because it, I had no way that I had been prepared for what I would see. Native Americans have always been very spiritual. They believed in spirit energies and guidance and all of the things that's, that spirituality would include. When I arrived on the other side, I was shocked. I did not expect to see people that were not Native American. I thought that that the other side would consist mainly of of the Sioux and the Cheyenne, and I thought that we would still have enemies over there that we'd have to fight. I thought that when we arrived, that we would be seen members of the army that had that had shown violence towards us, and that we would have to fight again on the other side. Once I arrived over here, I truly understood that we were wrong in mutilating the corpses of our enemies. There was, there was a beauty, an incredible beauty, great color. It was just, it was indescribable. I know that the afterlife came as a huge shock to me. It was something I truly was not prepared for. But are you loving it? Yes, I am loving it. 
but I am not loving the ability to watch all of the sadness and violence that is taking place. I know that this is all to be a lesson for us. I know that when we watch these things that it is to influence what we do when we do when we make our decisions to return. I wish I wish that we could do more to help those that are behind. I wish I wish that we could do a, be a better influence. But the one thing that we do see over here is that there's been little change in greed and hatred among humans from the time we walked the earth. It just takes different forms. What do you consider your biggest mistake in fighting the white man? My biggest mistake was to ever trust them. When I walked the earth, greed and power were driving the white man. They wanted our lands, and there was nothing we could basically do to stop them. They had, they had great resources. There were many, many of them. They were coming from all around the world to take our lands. Once, once gold was discovered, <laughs> that was the end. We couldn't stop them. What I think we should have done was to have attempted to stop the, the Black Hills expedition. We trusted what they had said. I think that if we had been able to stop that, at least we could have delayed what took place. Today, you're seeing much of the same type of greed that we had to live with. Hopefully, you'll be able to defeat it. Hopefully, people will understand that greed, the, the desire for power, the desire to kill others to take their possessions. We hope that they will understand that there is no way that they can succeed. Crazy Horse, I'm so happy that you agreed to meet with us this evening. It's been very educational. I feel the pain. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. Just as George wanted to thank you for allowing him to come through, I'd like to thank you as well. We never get a much much of a chance to speak, to be heard, to be believed. We were simply trying to preserve our way of life. There are many humans today that are trying to preserve their way of life. We watch the terrible war that is taking place in, in Europe, and the country that is being attacked is simply trying to protect their way of life. Not much changes through the ages. The desire for power, land, wealth leads to great violence. Until the individuals join together to stop the individuals that are showing this desire for power and wealth, your government, in my day, they lied to us. They're lying to you today. Not much has changed there. Why would you think it would? What is required is for the individuals to understand that they have to show love towards one another. I never considered it because I knew they were trying to take my way of life. I had to protect my people. I knew for me violence was the only thing, the only answer. Today you have choices. You have choices that I didn't have. Use those choices wisely. If you choose leaders that will do what is best for your country and for each individual in it, then your evolution will go well. 
if you do not pay the attention to history, then things will not go well. It's basically that simple. I wish, I wish that I could have lived a different life, but it was a life, it was a lesson I had to learn. I truly understand better from that life how deceit can mislead you and how easy it is to believe a lie that would, that would help you. So I want to thank you for coming through, allowing me to be here. I hope that you enjoy my, les- my message. And I thank you for having me here with George. We're good friends over here. He's a good person. I think that the day will come that we'll return and possibly together and maybe we can accomplish something. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I hope that all of you will make decisions so that you have a good life. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Crazy Horse and Colonel Custer. Okay. Next week we're going to have a pretty interesting show. The spirit of Harry Houdini has decided that he will come forward for us and We certainly have a lot of questions for him. So tell your friends about it. Join us next week. You can submit questions and suggestions for future guests through our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. My seventh book, Spirit Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, where books are sold, and you can get it on Kindle as well. I'm going to be having a new book come out in a couple months. It will be based on the channelings of the messages that we have received from Jesus. I hope that you will be interested in that and and support that when it comes out. Signed copies of all of our books are available on my website, spiritspredict.com, or wordsofgodthenandnow.com. I hope that you take time to watch the videos that we have on YouTube. We have almost 300 of them now, and we cover every subject imaginable. Our show that we do on Wednesday, Jesus Jesus Gives Us Messages. On Sundays, we work with uh, Reverend Bill Edelson, and we channel sermons from the great figures from religion. Uh, This morning, we actually channeled a message from Buddha. So, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope that you enjoyed the show. I did. I thought it was very special. Join us on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would also like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Have yourselves a wonderful week. God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.